Thanks, O. Um, so, can we get the presentation up? While the presentation's on its way, um, some of you probably know that we've been doing a lot of work on temperature effects, uh, elevated temperature, how that affects reef fissures and the sorts of temperatures increases that Janice uh, was talking about and that Malcolm talked about a, a couple of degrees Celsius and shown that in fact quite a few reef fissures are very sensitive, sensitive to even small increases in temperature and can affect things like growth, reproduction, uh, the survival of their offspring. But what I want to do today is not talk about the temperature effects, but something that's been considered um, a lot less, as I've just alluded to, and that is the potential effects of ocean acidification on reef fissures. So most of the work so far, people have been really concerned, obviously, about calcification, but we've been trying to work out whether there will be any effects of this increase in CO2 level uh, in the ocean on reef fissures. Make sure I've got the right one. Uh, just before I make a start, just like to thank the people that have funded this research, the Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, the School of Marine and Tropical Biology and the Australian Research Council. And a couple of people that have been heavily involved, Daniel Dixon and Jennifer Donaldson, they're uh, PhD students of mine, just recognise them and a bunch of collaborators. So we've seen this graph already in various forms this morning and uh, you all know that CO2 levels have gone up about 35% in the last 250 years from around about 280 ppm pre-industrial to over 390 ppm now. And there's a few things we can also get from this graph uh, that you know, it's been it was relatively stable under 300 ppm for 2,000 years before the present. And in fact, it was, the CO2 has been pretty stable below um, 300 for over 650,000 years. So we're really, we're in very uncharted territory up here. Around about 30% of the excess carbon dioxide that has been produced since the start of the industrial age has already been absorbed by the ocean. And as Janice said, in fact, global warming would be an awful lot worse uh, if this wasn't happening. But it does come at a consequence uh, and the ocean is becoming more acidic and the carbonate chemistry of the ocean is changing and will continue to change as more carbon dioxide is dissolved, as Malcolm told us. And it's estimated that uh, ocean pH has declined by 0.1 of a unit since the start of the industrial age. Uh, here we have the, the equations. I won't go through those. Simple enough just to say that CO2 levels in the ocean are going up, dissolved CO2 levels. Carbonic acid goes up, bicarbonate levels are going up, hydrogen ions go up. Uh, with acidification, carbonate ions go down, uh, pH goes down, and we measure that as minus log of hydrogen ions. So that's basically what, what's going on. If we look at, at the projections, where we're headed, atmospheric CO2 is predicted to be somewhere in the range of 730 to 120 ppm by 2100 on the A2 scenario. That's effectively a business as usual scenario from IPCC. And that would cause the ocean pH to decline another 0.3 to 0.4 units in that time. And this is obviously a, a major problem for marine calcifiers, such as uh, corals, echinoderms, uh, gastropods, and some bivalves, because, uh, oops, because aragonite would become undersaturated in the ocean somewhere around about the middle of the century or in the latter part of the century. But uh, we, calcification is not the only thing we need to be concerned about. When there's extra CO2 dissolved in the water, that actually can dissolve into the animal tissue itself, often across the gills, and effectively act to acidify the animal tissue much the same way as it is the ocean. We already know that really high levels of CO2, uh, hypercapnia, can affect all sorts of things in marine animals, things like uh, their survival and growth, development and metabolism but we really know very, very little about how levels of CO2, dissolved CO2 that are relevant to climate change are going to affect marine fishes or other non-calcifying organisms. We do know that a lot of adult fish seem to be quite good at regulating what we call their acid-base balance. So basically regulating their own internal pH. Uh, and adult fish seem to be pretty, pretty good at this. So there's a feeling that they won't be particularly susceptible. But there's been great concern about the early life history stages, the eggs and the larvae of these little, uh, the tiny little fish, 
and how things like their embryonic uh, duration and survival might be affected, larval development, growth rates, uh, things like their swimming performance might be affected by these elevated CO2 levels. And until recently, people didn't even consider how behaviour might be affected. So we've been looking at these things uh, in larval development, in particular in this fish, Amphiprion percula. Um, this is good old Nemo. We really like this fish for a number of reasons. Um, everyone knows it, of course, and Disney love it, so you know, we like Nemo. But uh, more importantly, it's a really good model species for coral reefs. It lays benthic eggs, uh, they hatch after a few days, and then they're out in these little larvae are out in the plankton for about 11 days, and then they come back and find a reef and they settle down to adult habitat. So they're a very good model species, and we're able to rear them very successfully in the lab. So we can do some really quite sophisticated experiments with them, uh, and, uh, and test some of these ideas. And what we're doing is we've been rearing these fish uh, under a range of treatment, um, 390 ppm, the controls, and then 550 ppm, 750 and 1,030 ppm. We do this with multiple parents, so we've got multiple genetic lines, and we do it from the, the day that the eggs are laid until these little fish are competent to settle, which is 11 days post-hatching, when they would normally come back and settle down to the reef. And this is a... a picture of one of these tiny little larvae that's competent to settle next to a five cent piece. So you can see the sort of size of organisms that we're actually dealing with here. And just to, to remind you that no, these are not ad hoc values that we're testing here. Uh, so the top end of our treatments are relevant to the range for the IPCC A2 emissions trajectory predictions for 2100. Um, the 550 is relevant to where we might be mid-century if we don't get uh, pretty serious pretty soon, or uh, it's also relevant to some of the capping strategies that have been talked about by people like Nicola Stern and the others that are talking about around about 550 capping to avoid dangerous climate change. So it's, we've set these as, uh, as useful uh, targets for our experiments. And the sorts of things we're interested in with, uh, with these fish are things like embryonic uh, duration, egg survival, size of hatching, yolk provisioning, size of settlement, their swimming performance, and their settlement behaviour. And I'll get straight into some results. Uh, if people want to ask about the, the way we do this, I can chat to people later, but I think the more interesting things are the results. First of all, what do, what do these fish look like at hatching when they've been reared under elevated CO2? And the news is actually pretty good. And I'm just going to show you mostly results for the controls and the extreme, the highest level we've used. But first of all, I can say we see no effects of CO2 on embryonic duration in these clownfish. Embryonic duration is always six to seven days. It doesn't matter whether they've been treated with CO2 or not. We see no effect on egg survival. It's around about 65% in our experiments. It's highly variable, but there's no effect of CO2. We see no effect on size of hatching. And again, here's the, uh, the controls. These are the size of the fish at hatching. This is under 1,000 uh, ppm CO2. And you'll see they're certainly not smaller. If anything, there may be a little bit of a trend towards them being bigger. Uh, and we see a very small effect on yolk area. It's around about 6%, but it's quite small. So at hatching, things uh, look pretty good. That's so far good news. If we look at uh, what the fish are like at settlement, uh, it gets more interesting, but again, it's reasonably good news. These are, I'll just walk you through these graphs. These are either the size or the weight of the fish at the end of their, their larval phase, at the end of that 11 days. And these are for four groups of fish that were split and put into a, the different treatments. And what you can see is that two of these groups, uh, at least at standard length, was pretty well unaffected. It's a bit variable, but unaffected by, um, by CO2. Two of the groups actually were about 15% larger under elevated CO2. The, the larvae were on average a bit bigger. If we look at weight, the two of the groups were exactly the same. Other two groups, the larvae were in fact big, a little bit bigger under elevated CO2. So all of this is, is pointing to the fact that there's a lot of variation between uh, clutches that we've been rearing, but there doesn't seem to be any negative effect of elevated CO2 on the basic life history traits of these little larvae at the end of their larval phase. The other thing we've looked at as well is the otoliths, oops, <laughs> the otoliths of these fish. Um, and these are the ear bones of the fish, and they're made from aragonite. And so, of course, we've heard all about how uh, aragonites are going to become undersaturated. There's concerns with calcification, and people have been worried about whether the ear bones of the fish might also suffer. Uh, it's very preliminary so far, but 
our results so far suggest that the ear bones, the aragonite ear bones of these fish are also unaffected. So because they're internal, perhaps these fish are able to um, uh, actually adjust the environment around the aragonite uh, ear bones so that they're not, they don't uh, suffer the, the problems of calcification. So, so far, pretty good news. We wanted to go beyond just sort of looking at things like length and weight, and that's interesting. How about some performance measures? So we thought we'll give these, these fish a little swim test, and we put them in a, a chamber here. We've got a current coming through. We put the little larvae in, and we, we increase the current steadily to see what the maximum speed is that they can swim against. And we do this for a whole bunch of fish, and we've done this for 250 fish that have been reared at each of the different uh, CO2 levels, and what we found that either the rearing level or the test level of CO2 had no effect on their swimming ability. So they're clearly getting enough oxygen, they can swim, their aerobic performance is good, the CO2 doesn't seem to be affecting them. So all the things are, are really looking pretty good so far. The next thing we wanted to do was have a look at their behaviour and Amphiprion perculas turned out to be a great model for this as well because some previous work that we did showed that these little anemone fish are attracted to the smell of tropical plant leaves. As bizarre as it sounds, it, 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 there's some logic in it. These uh, little fish like to live around on reefs surrounding vegetated islands, and particularly in Papua New Guinea where we do a lot of this work. And it, you could Im well imagine that the sort of no leaves coming off the islands could be a very good cue, a chemical cue, for these little fish to be able to find their way back to appropriate reefs at the end of their larval phase. And in this previous work, we showed that yes, they do, they love the smell of tropical uh, plant leaves. They don't really care much about grass, they're not attracted to it or um, repelled from it, but they, they really hate this other thing, Melaleuca, which is a swamp tree uh, that also has quite potent oils in the leaves. So we've, we've shown previously that they're attracted to the smell of tropical plant leaves. The way we do this sort of work, it's, uh, it's bucket ecology, nothing too sophisticated. We have uh, a couple of buckets, we put different uh, water with different olfactory cues in it, we feed it down into a little flume, and Nemo can sit in the flume and choose one water stream or the other. We can swap the water stream around, and this little contraption here just allows us to do that, just to make sure there's no side effect in the, the chamber. And we can do this for larvae that have either been reared in control water, or those that have been in acidified water. And this is where things started to get really interesting. So I'm just going to walk you through this. This is the results uh, for larvae that were either reared in control water here in the, the open bars or acidified water. Uh, first of all, if there was just seawater on both sides of the flume, they spent about 50% of time on either side. So they were behaving quite normally in the flume. This is uh, for control ones. This is the tropical plant leaf. They are very strongly attracted to that. They won't even go into the water flume that has melaleuca in it. They don't care about grass, they spend, there's no preference, they spend 50% of the time on either side of the chamber. And we also tested anemones because we already knew that they uh, actually prefer the smell of anemones when they're nice and close to them. So we, we tested that and indeed they maintain that um, preference for them. In the acidified water, uh, those that have been reared in acidified water, they sh still showed a uh, good behaviour in the chamber 50% of the time on either side. They still showed a preference for the tropical plant leaf, although not so strong. But this is the really critical thing here, is they went from a complete avoidance of melaleuca to a very strong attraction to that cue. Uh, they show, started to show a preference for grass, uh, and they still showed a preference for anemones. So the, what you can see there here is that they've gone from being able to discriminate between some olfactory cues to suddenly showing a preference for all cues that we presented them with. And that was at 1,000 ppm. Uh, at higher levels, we, we went a little bit higher and we tried 1600 ppm and actually their olfactory system just shut down. They just sat, they, they swam at the end of the, the flume and, and didn't make any choices at all. So that's quite, uh, was obviously quite worrying and we've been we've go going a little bit further on this. Uh, one thing, another reason that actually Percula turned out to be a great fish to work on was that Jeff Jones and others have fairly recently shown that around about 60% of the little clownfish that are coming back to reefs are self-recruited. So they're coming back to their home reef. If you think about that, you've got about 60% of these fish, little fish that are coming back are coming back to their home reef. They settle into an anemone that's a little patch of habitat and there's not that many of them on a reef. And those anemones already have a breeding pair on them. 
so there's a reasonable chance that they might actually come back and settle with their parents. So we thought that there might be some mechanism to prevent inbreeding. So we tried that. We actually gave them the choice of the smell, water containing the smell of their parents versus other anemone fish. Whoops. And for the, those that were uh, in control water, they almost completely ab avoid the flume containing their parents. They can, they can smell their parents and they avoid them. They won't settle with them. If you give them another anemone fish, they love it. They'll go there. That's fantastic. Uh, and if we give them both the parent smell and another anemone fish together, they always go to the other anemone fish. So they can discriminate between those two cues presented together. They have amazing olfactory ability. It's just um, incredible. In acidified water, suddenly they show a preference for their parents that wasn't there before. They're still uh, attracted to conspecific, but they can no longer distinguish between uh, parents and non-parents. So again, we're seeing the same pattern that uh, they, are, they become attracted to any olfactory cue. So that's a whole bunch of fairly disturbing things about their olfactory system. And we thought, well, could it get any worse? And probably about the worst thing you could do is be attracted to predators. And we hoped this wouldn't work, but in fact, it did. Um, and, and this is really quite disturbing, I think. We, we've now tested, um, well, Daniel Dixon, who, who did a lot of this work, has shown that these little larvae have an innate ability to smell predators when they get to the reef. So they often settle at night. So it would probably be really good if you could sniff out a predator and make sure you didn't actually settle right next door to it. And so in the control water, they will not go into the, the flume, the stream of water containing the predator smell. They, they're quite happy to go into the flume containing uh, a non-predator, this little herbivore here. The, they don't really care about it. They'll swim in that water or, or the next door water. If you give them the choice of predator water or non-predator water, they always go to non-predator water, so they, won't spend, they don't spend any time in the predator water. The fish that have been reared in acidified water suddenly show a very strong attraction to predators. Um, and it's easy to imagine that's probably not a good thing. Uh, they are now strongly attracted to uh, uh, non-predators and they are unable to distinguish between the two. So once again, their olfactory system has been affected in such a way that they're actually just being attracted to any cue. And so now we have a whole bunch of, of important ecological cues that they seem to be responding to in a, in a, in a po very poor way. So the, the basic sort of message here is that the larvae are unable to discriminate between olfactory cues that are normally preferred and those that are normally avoided. Um, clearly they could be attracted to suboptimal habitats and predators. This is only one species of fish, this is just one clownfish but we believe it will probably transfer to other fish. And of course, if it's broader than this, then there's potentially a very serious issue for uh, population replenishment and connectivity, sustainability of marine populations. Uh, I can tell you that we've done a whole lot of um, uh, an anatomy on the, the nose of these fish. So we've looked using uh, electron microscopy. We've looked at the development of the nose. That doesn't seem to be affected. So it's not some sort of um, developmental problem that just because they're in CO2, the cilia and those sorts of things aren't developing properly, properly, it looks like it's more to do with the transmission of the signal within the sensory system. And I can talk to people more about that later if they want. Uh, so in terms of con uh, conclusions, uh, even though people were really worried about the, the life history stages of the fish and their, their ability just to grow and, uh, and survive, we're not really seeing any effects of elevated CO2 on the egg stage on things like their growth, development and swimming performance. So there's a lot of really good news there. But we are seeing very serious and what we think are quite dramatic effects on behaviour at around about 1,000 ppm CO2. And clearly this could have some pretty far-reaching implications. Um, the things we're working on now, which I think are the really important next steps, are things like the threshold effects. So we know 1,000 ppm affects behaviour. Uh, when does that actually ki kick in at lower levels? Uh, are there interacting effects of temperature and CO2? And very, very importantly, uh, is there any capacity for acclimation and adaptation? And I'll leave it there.